Hey everybody, my name is John Beverly. I'm going to be talking about basic formal ontology today. Um, to give you an idea of the structure of the talk. Here. Two parts. Part one, I'm going to go through part one pretty quickly because I know you guys are already experts on Buffo. But I'm going to give you a little refresher what it does and why. Tell you what Buffo implementations are, which is what I've been working on for the past uh, semester. And um, tell you about some of my work, mine and Fumiaki's work, on the Buffo uh, first order logic, that's FOL, first order logic update. Then in part two, I'm going to show, uh, tell you what I think is probably the more interesting thing that I've been doing, which is not exactly updating the implementation, but um, translating everything into a theorem prover and proving cool stuff about mm -hmm. Buffo, some of the consequences. I'll give you several examples depending on the time, and um, talk about the upshot and future work for that. So. Everything you thought you knew about Buffo. It's probably right. Well, let me tell you a little more. <laughs> <laughs> so, basic formal ontology, um, based on a theory developed by Smith and Grennan. I think I'm pronouncing his name right. Um, uh, it's an upper level domain neutral ontology. Basically, you get things, you get a smaller or sub ontologies, low level ontologies, material ontologies. You put those into this bigger upper level framework. And uh, kind of translate the the domain level stuff into this upper level stuff. That way, they'll, all of these domain level ontologies can kind of talk to each other. This solves things like data silo problems, makes it um, queryable, and as long as it's uh, formulated with rigor and according to uh, the principles laid down by Smith and Grennan, turns out uh, you don't run into these weird mistakes that previous ontological ventures had encount encountered, as Smith rightly points out. Um, here's the hierarchy. Isn't it pretty? <clears throat> these all should be familiar, things like entities, these, these types, or these categories, continuous occurrence. I'm going to be talking about several of these. It's good to have this here, though, in case you have any questions, because I'm going to be talking somewhere about at this level of depth later with some of the examples I use. If you have any questions or want to see exactly, like, look at how they relate to each other, just ask. I'll come back. Slide six. Um, Buffo, used by many people. This is from Infamous. Um, I have the website here. I could not capture all of the various projects that are using Buffo because the list was quite long. You see, it cuts up here. If you want more information, go to this website. See all the various people that are using Buffo, right? All well, these ontologies talking to one another, what not They're able to. Now, Buffo, basic form ontology, is, uh, has versions. It's uh, people discuss and dispute and debate over what should be in the upper level ontology. And because of this, there have been significant changes. Uh, right now, we're in Buffo 2.0. It's the second version. This this has been on the table since about 2011. 2000, I'm not sure, but it's uh, it itself has undergone lots of changes too, which we'll talk about in just a minute. Now, uh, an implementation of this of the theory, the Buffo theory, is going to be realization of a technical specification as a program or a software component. You see things like here are going to be implementations. Owl. This is used in web development protege. This is a implementation of Buffo. Cliff, this is a common logic interface format. This is like a very abstract lingua franca for lots of different logics. We can talk to each other. Um, this has a lot of potential still being developed right now. Um, first order logic. These are actually go pretty closely together. Um, this is commonly used um, in, in its very theorem prover friendly in a way that Cliff at the moment is not, which I've talked a little bit more about. Anyway, these are implementations of the, the Buffo specification. Uh, now, this Buffo version 2 implementation um, this requires, when, when these new versions come out, they're going to require new like updating of the specifications. Um, so that requires updating to say, if we're thinking about these, owl, cliff, full. Um, at uh, the end of summer 2012, uh, several individuals who worked in Buffo projects, they got together to present uh, updated um, implementations. And so what they did, they produced the 2012 a Cliff version of Buffer 2 and a first order logic axiom at translation version in uh, LaTeX, input and output. Okay, this is useful. Um, the LaTeX itself was converted in this nice, look at that font, it's so pretty. In a nice way that you could see and view in a PDF, um, just see like the logic. I'll show you in a minute. Like this. So. Here's an example. You can pull this straight out of the, the text file. Um, for using it, you'll find full axioms. So for all x, if x is a continuum, then it's an entity. Right? 
So it's something you would find in the buffer re reference manual or the specification, uh, or at least this, this kind of reasoning. And this would be the way you captured it with first order logic. Good. Right. Here's an example. I'm an entity. <laughs> well, look, the axioms are changing. They often change. Like I said, lots of disputes, lots of, lots of changes to even, even the version. So um, we needed to, so I'm about to change since 2012, we needed to update it. Um, this, this young man, this aspiring magician, and this young man, also an aspiring magician, what's up for me? Uh, we, we took the task of updating this. Um, I'm, I'm happy to report that it's been done. Um, let me say that one more time. The, the file's been updated, the text file's updated, the um, cliff file's updated. This, this works. On the, uh, happy to report it's been accomplished. Um, now, that's probably the least interesting stuff. Uh, I know I went through that quickly. I'm not, it's done, so I don't care so much about it. If you have any questions, go ahead and ask before I move on to what I find the most interesting thing. I, uh, I know that part of the grade is going to be like asking questions, uh, good questions, a fortiori questions. So I'm going to need questions, <laughs> so this is kind of like the roll the dice. We'll see if it's a good question, because <laughs> it's better than no question. Are you asking us for questions? That's what I'm doing. Okay, right? so I clear policy <laughs> questions. <laughs> All right. So I'll ask one. Um, what's an implementation? Realization of a technical specification. Reference manual is a program okay. or software component, not software. All right. yeah. Does that make Did I move through that too quickly? Yeah. I, mean, I get super excited, man. Sorry. <laughs> Is that? Yeah. Okay, from your first set of pages, I can feel your love logic. I appreciate <laughs> that. Uh, so my question is, um, using um, two sentences um, to describe uh, what's the major difference between AI perspective of logic and philosophy perspective of logic? What's the major idea difference between these two perspectives? Well, one, uh, the AI tends to be more focused on things like complexity and computational power. And then, and then on the other side, if you're doing philosophy, then just think more about the expressivity of your, your logic, how it can be implemented in philosophical theory, like metaphysical programs, things like that. I would say that's not two sentences. Complexity versus like expressive power. Also, the logic came first. Well, well, sure. Well, historically, the logic was first. I mean, the philosophical. Well, the philosophical mm -hmm. logic. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Could you use only first order logic, and uh, did you have to use second order logic? Uh, first order. Uh, stick stick them in the first order. order. Yeah. Enough, or the formalization of the code. That's something I'm trying to, to understand. It's so, part of my work. <laughs> So you discuss this, you, you, uh, right? You say that you, you're still within the realm of first order logic, but you're just you're you're using you're quantifying over relations. So for we, relations, we quantify both over instances and over universals. And over universals. So I've, I've that just... way we can simulate having quantification of the predicate, mm -hmm. but without treating the predicate as predicate, we treat them as, as constant terms. Yeah. yeah. And then we have relations like is that or part of, mm -hmm. which link predicates. Yes. But in fact, they link names to the verb. Yes. So we're still right in the realm of first order. Yeah. I I had to think a lot about that too. It wasn't clear to me, but yeah. yeah. So then is it, so would it seem like uh, Buffo, how friendly is Buffo to modal? That doesn't have modal, no modal, modal aspect, modal implementation. Well, this, um, I wouldn't call it. Yeah, very. It's as close as it's going to get. But you're not going to have like sentential operators like that to quantify over worlds or models like with worlds. Like that. Right. I'm going to move on to the interesting stuff. Oh wait, it's too interesting. Okay. So. Dr. Diaper in 2013, he advised moving to a union user-friendly automated theorem prover or various user-friendly theorem provers, <clears throat> such as things like Prover 9. This is just from a slide he used. Um, and the idea is if you can you, you axiomatize Buffo and you um, basically plug it into a prover and you see what falls out. <laughs> it's a nice, nice way to prove theorems. Because I don't know, 
if you guys have done a lot of logic, um, let me skip that one, but doing a lot of first order stuff is boring. Like after a while, you just get tired of doing, proving the same thing. It's like typing hello world when you're learning a language or something. Come on. <laughs> I had a linear algebra professor who, who once in our class, like the first day, he said, hey, show of hands, how many of you can compute large numbers in your head? Like half the class, this is a big auditorium, half the class raised their hand and he goes, don't do that. That's silly. Computers can do that for you. Why would you do that? <laughs> and he's right, because the class is about proving things, doing things that computers couldn't do. We're doing like more advanced topics, so you shouldn't be wasting your mental energy. Similarly, I don't want to waste my mental energy trying to prove whether or not located in at is transitive. I, I just let a computer do that for me. Again, yeah, don't waste time when a computer can do it for you. Um, nevertheless, using, so theorem provers can help you just like a calculator might, but uh, it's still going to require some kind of creativity. Uh, theorem provers don't, <laughs> if you put something in a theorem prover and you say, what falls out, it's going to be there for a while. <laughs> Do you have enough, <laughs> enough axioms? So instead you, you have to query, you have to ask, like, is this a theorem? Can you prove this? What do you think? Right. you gotta, you got to know what to look for, so there's a creative aspect. Um, a lot of theorem provers require modularization, or a lot, they will require modularization with an axiomatic system the size of a buffer. Comparatively speaking, it's a pretty big axiom system. Um, modularization is going to be taking some subset of all of the axioms, plugging it in somewhere, proving things about that subset, and maybe combining it with others. I'm going to give you so, several examples in just a minute how we do that, or how I do that. So Ray, uh, Dr. Dykert did point out when he was discussing the prover uh, automated theorem prover stuff that uh, there's no no way to easily translate cliff all or these these latex files into a language that common automated theorem provers can use and he's right there are people working on those projects but they're not like there's no immediate translation there um, but prover nines language is close enough to uh, the text or, or common logic as it was already specified or implemented, that uh, that could be easily translated by me. So I went ahead and did that. <laughs> now Prover and I can read all the axioms. Um, incidentally, this is me before I started. <laughs> it's ready to go. And this is me after. <laughs> Took a while. <laughs> it wasn't exactly easy, but it's done. Um, this is just a snapshot of my folder. I uh, modularized, this is what I mean by modularized, I took, you know, continuing axioms. It is a very brute force method I used here. Anything that mentioned continuant is in this file. Anything that mentioned generically dependent continuant is fine. It's going to be a lot of overlap. I need to, you know, clean that, some of that stuff up. But right now, that's, that's how they're modularized. All right. Now, I can, you can easily just input these into Prover 9. I'm, I'm a, we're going to walk through Prover 9 in just a second. That's the automated theorem prover I've been, I, I use for this. Here's the, the nice, cool snapshot of the, the user interface. Uh, but I want to back up just slightly. I want to show you how it works before we show we start doing some of the, the real buffer Um. All right. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> you set the premises in the GUI in the, in the graphical user interface, and then you set a goal. This is what I was talking about a minute ago about being you got to have some kind of creativity to figure out what the goal is. Um, this took me a long time to figure out. I was like, is that the goal I should be looking for? <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is just modus ponens. Uh, here's a proof. <laughs> a sentential logic um, modus ponens resolution proof. Prover 9 works by resolution. That is, it, it, cl it's, it clausifies things or clausifies premises. And what that means, it puts them in conjunctive normal form. A conjunctive normal form is a, a form, it's a series of conjunctions or it's a series of disjuncts conjunctively joined together with negations. So P then Q, logically equivalent to not P or Q, clausifies in that way, and then it negates the goal, tries to find a contradiction, proof by reductio. This is a very common, it's a common way that automated theorem provers work. This is, this is actually general, like it's, it's a computationally fine, it, it can solve a lot of really big problems very quickly. Um, and it was, again, also one of the ones that uh, Dyfert advised using, and Fabian, too. He said, you know, if we could do this, yeah, so you should. Um, we'll try another example, this one using first-order logic. We've got here a disjunctive syllogism with quantifiers, right? 
And this is how you would input it on X on Y. And the way the language works is I don't have to put premises or parentheses around it, so you see. And it does not exist on PX. Okay? So everything's PX or GX. Not the case there exists a PX. And then I put prove this that there exists a GX. Just jump through syllogism. Okay? So what the way prover nine works is it negates that somewhere here. It's going to end up negating that that there exists a G, and it proves a contradiction. So you infer that there's or yeah. So it says not exist a G, shows a contradiction, infers there is a G. All right, now it's time to put away the toys though. Uh, lots of this is going to be like screenshots of my computer. I tried to get rid of If you see anything that looks, John, what is that? Don't. I tried to get rid of all that stuff. Here's, here's the GUI. Open the input files. You generate axioms. Um, and, and the generation is just opening the input files. I've already done the work of, gen, of like putting them into a file. And you see here, these should look pretty familiar. These are some of the things you would see in a buffo specification in the Prover 9 notation. Or the, the Prover 9 language. And I also have the citation number commented out so you can see where to look. Um, yeah. Remember this one? I'm an entity. Right? <laughs> and this is the continuum file. So everything that mentions continuum is going to be in there. Um, let's look at some more examples or, or, or actual examples from Buffo. <clears throat> so S depends on specifically dependence, kind of like existential, kind of like existential dependence. Um, specified in Buffo 2.0, holds between. A's and B's at a time, such that they share no parts. B exists, C must exist, and B is neither a boundary nor a sign. Uh, it's similar, like I said, similar to existential dependence. Here are some examples. Pain, specifically depending on an organism, or organism and uh, gait, specifically depending on a walk. Intuitively, this is going to be an irreflexive relation. The reason is because continuants are parts of themselves. One of the aspects of buffo. Um, so every continuant is a continuant part of itself. And uh, because of that, since S dependence is something where they share, or a relation that sh where the, the entities share no parts in common, you should be able to infer that specific dependence is not reflexive. So nothing S depends on itself, because since everything, every continuant is part of itself, that's a part in common with itself, right? Is that reasoning? Okay. Just trying to pump the motivate or the intuitions here that this should be a plausible thing to prove. And it is. It's provable. You just plug it in and prove it that specifically dependent continuance or specific depends on is, is irreflexive. That's what I call true. <laughs> Let's look at material entities now. Material entities is a continuance. These are, you know, things with material or matter as parts. Uh, if uh, plausibly, if an entity has a continuous part, it's a material. Oh, crap. I've been talking too long. Uh, I didn't realize. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of. You get the general strategy. I'm gonna kind of show you some of the things I prove rather than walking through all the details. So this is what I'm proving. If an entity has a continuous part that is a material entity, then that thing's a continuant. Here's how. Here's the input file that you would see. Voila, theorem is proved. Proven on it. <laughs> this is a trivial. You can prove very trivial axioms too. If a continuous part of material entity at a time, then it, or an object is, then an object is an independent. Continuous. This actually just falls out of independent continuous being, I'm sorry, objects being material entities and being independent continuous. It is trivial, and the proof is pretty trivial too. Um, a less trivial thing is a uh, process profile of relation, uh, showing that if something is a process profile of something else, and there's another thing that is a continuum part of the Y, and it's not identical to X. This, this straight out of the buffer specifications should be something that's that's provable, and uh, it is. It just takes a long time. I actually cut it off. It's a very long proof. It took a lot. I thought it wasn't going to prove it for a minute. It just kept running. I was like, no. <laughs> the numbers down the left. The numbers are some of the premises that are being used, oh, or, or some <coughs> sorry, the the numbers in the the uh, modularized. So it's file. not ours. No, gosh, no. <laughs> My computer wouldn't run that long. <laughs> I don't think it ever has. Uh, okay, okay, so I proved some, some just kind of interesting theorems. Um, what else do I have? It's useful for proving the theorems, but it's likely, likely more useful for reworking the way the axioms are formulated currently. Um, so these, because they may lead to undesirable consequences. Um, so rather than, 
There's one way you might approach capture or constructing buffalo too, and that's like top down. You come with your axioms on the table, and you're like, I guess this is what would fall out of these. Let's put them on the table. <laughs> Another way you might, or in supplement to that, go is say, here, let's let a theorem prover pull out all the consequences of these axioms, and if we get anything we don't want, figure out which axioms did what, and go back and rework it. I think that's the better way to go about it. I don't have that kind of foresight, sorry. So, Prover 9, let's just do that. I'm going to use process profile as an example because it's kind of underdeveloped and you can, <laughs> can prove that something, if it's a process profile, is both an occurrent and a continuant. <laughs> Here's the proof. It's, it's pretty long too, but it's an unfortunate consequence. You don't want process profile to be both a continuant and an occurrent. <laughs> you like it? The proof will set you free? I, t I told him beforehand. I was like, I got some pretty good puns here. <laughs> oh, blasphemy, is it? Um, yeah, the lesson to learn, given the resolution method, we can identify problematic premises. And since they were all laid out, the premises, we can just look to see which ones cause the damage, make adjustments where needed. Um, this allows us to work backwards in noting those consequences. Uh, finding all the, uh, future work, finding all my mistakes. I made a lot. <laughs> I just tell you now, preface paradox. Yeah. Uh, prove independence of axioms using this modular resolution method. Um, which is something you could just, you know, you could do manually, but nobody wants to. Uh, parsimoniously redefine predicates in terms of the fewest primitives and then ensure alignment with philosophical motivations. Those are things to do in the future that I think Prover 9 and these automated theorem provers in general would be, be helpful in pursuing. Uh, Started from the Prover Network here. Questions? <laughs> Is the Prover 9 easy to, for the beginner? Yeah, absolutely. That's one of the benefits of it. So um, like, there are other theorem provers, things that can, let's say, read Cliff directly, like Hex is, is one, but it's it's got a steep learning curve. Uh, this Prover 9, uh, you can just go home to it. I'll send you the X and you can start playing with it now. Like, you not a learning curve, just plug it in and say, can you prove that? Boom. More importantly, easy for you? Mm-hmm. Oh, good. Mm -hmm.